Shall we have a word of prayers before we proceed? Shall we pray? Father, thank you for such an awesome opportunity that you've given to us to come together like this in your name. Lord, we know that any time you bring your people together, it is because you have a word to declare to them. Therefore, Lord, we are confident of this, that your word is present here today. I therefore ask that as this word will come forth, that you will open the eyes and the understanding of your people, that they will be able to comprehend the truth of your word, that this word will establish them in their faith and in your divine purpose and destiny for their lives. And that gifts that you have given to them will be activated, will be released and be maximized to your glory and to your praise. And Lord, I'm asking that you will confirm your word even with signs, wonders, and miracles in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And somebody say, Amen. Amen. Let me quickly say this. Uh, I am not more of a preacher. I am more of a teacher. Because I want to expound some things and some principles to you that is foundational to your divine purpose and to your destiny. So for this reason, I will really appreciate if you have your pen and paper that you take notes. Especially the scripture verses and some of the references I'm going to give, it is important that you take note of it. So that after this meeting, you can go back home and make a research over and over as you go through that which you have written. And the Lord will give you greater understanding of the things that we have spoken of. So that it will be beneficial to your faith and to your work. Amen. Uh, the last time I came, I came with my books and... And a lot of my books were sold here, and I believe that those of you who bought the books, you read the books. Uh, but I've just written, recently written one, and I want to speak on that one. I don't have any books available, so I just want to speak out of one that I've just written now, the last book. And I want you to come with me. The title of this book is called Maximizing Your Potential. Maximizing Your Potential. And for us to look into this theme or this subject today, it is important for us to take note of these two words, maximizing and the word potential. Are you with me? I want us to define that word potential. The word potential is generally referred to as an unrealized ability that is capable of development into future sources and reality. I want to say that again, and I want you to get. It. I want to. I want to make sure. I want to make sure you get this. A potential is generally referred to as an unrealized ability that is capable of development into future 
realities and sources. These potentials are considered as what you would say they are latent qualities. In the English word, you probably will call it talents. Or you can call it gifts, skills, or as we say, your abilities. So a potential is your talent, is your gift, is your skill, and your ability. And one thing you must understand concerning potential, it is an inward endowment that the Lord has given to men. Are you with me? It is an inward what? Endowment that the Lord has given to men. So it is not something you go to a Bible school or you go to a college or some kind of educational institution to learn or to acquire. Are you with me? Either the same thing like the five-fold ministry, for example, me calling myself a pastor or a teacher or evangelist or whatever. It is not something you go to a Bible school to learn and become an apostle or a pastor or a teacher. The scriptures makes it clear that no man can take this vocation upon himself except he is called by God. Come on, are you with me? So, it is something that the heavens endorse and it is imparted to you as a divine gift. Come on, are you with me? <laughs> so you must understand your potential is something that God has divinely deposited in you as part of your DNA or as part of his divine purpose and plan for your life. Can you understand that? But I want you to understand this potential. A dear brother in the faith who has gone to be with the Lord, Dr. Miles Moreau, defines potential as this. He calls, he calls it dormant ability. He says your potential is what? It's a dormant ability, something that is dormant. It's there, but it's dormant. He calls it untapped strength. It is the strength that you have within you that has not yet been tapped. He calls it unused sources. He calls it hidden talents. And I love this one. He calls it capped capability. In other words, these talents, these gifts, these potentials are in you. But to some, we are not aware of it. I'm going to come, come, come to that. It is for, for example, there is a high wall here. And when you look at this wall, something tells you that you cannot jump through. Right? You just look at it and say it's impossible. But so, you're looking at the wall, you say, mm, it's not possible. But so, suddenly... Example, there is a dog, uh, a wild dog that is on the chain, tied somewhere. And you've been seeing that dog, and of course you know that it's on the chain, so it can't do anything. But it keep, keeps backing at you. And suddenly, the chain breaks loose. And that dog is coming after you. And you know there is no way out. And suddenly, you look at that wall. Before you know it, pew, you scale through and you get on the other side. <sighs> You're saying, thank God. And suddenly you look. But initially something told you that you cannot. 
But when the dog came, suddenly you realize that the ability to scale through that fence was in you, but you never realized it was there until that dog was cut loose. Come on, I don't know whether some of you can understand what I'm trying to say. Every one of you seated here today, God has given you potentials and some of these potentials have not yet been discovered. And you must understand that the fulfillment of your divine purpose is connected to the maximizing of those potentials. Come on, are you with me? Dr. Miles Moreau said this, that the richest place upon the face of the earth it's not Australia. It's not the gold mines of South Africa or the oil wells of the, uh, the uh, Arab nations or so forth. They say, but the richest place upon the face of the earth is the graveyard, the cemetery. Why? He said, because there are thousands and millions or billions of people who have died without discovering their potential to fulfill those potentials. Are you with me? And he made this statement. He says, see to it that before you die and leave this earth, that you die empty. In other words, every potential in you, every gift, every talent in you was discovered, unleashed, and maximized before you leave the face of the earth. That you can say like Paul, I have fought a good fight of faith. I have finished my cause. Come on, are you with me? <laughs> but you can only say that when the potentials in you has been discovered and maximized. Some of you are looking at me here. Can I say this to you? You can double your impact. Did you hear what I just said? You can do what? You can double your impact. Because some of you think that you have reached the limit but I want to let you know that by the grace of God and by that which God has deposited in you, you can double your impact that you have made by discovering that gift and that talent that is in you. Come on, are you with me? We're still going to talk more on this. But let's look at this one. The word maximize, to maximize means to make the best use of something. To maximize means to make the best use of something or to increase something as much as possible in a way that you can get the best result out of it. I want to define what that, that word maximize means. To make the best use of something. It also means to increase something as much as possible in a way that you get the best result out of it. So when we say, we, when we say you need to maximize your potential, it means to make the best use of your ability and to increase it into success. Are you following me? In order for us to be able to maximize our potential, it is necessary to first discover your potential. Are you with me? It is important for you to do what? First discover your potential so you can know the source of your potential and secondly, the purpose of your potential. Because it is one thing to discover what your potential is. 
but it's a different thing for you to know the purpose why that potential is given to you. Come on, are you with me? And let me say this, I'm going to say that again. A lot of us have been able to discover our gifts and our talent, but unfortunately it looks like some of us do not know the purpose why it has been given to us. As a result of that, somebody said, many of us are very successful, but we are successful in the wrong assignment. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want to say that again. We are very successful in what we do, but unfortunately, we are successful in the wrong assignment. And when you and I stand before the Lord, you are not going to be judged by what you have done primarily. You will be judged by that which he has assigned you to do. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? We're coming there. We're coming there. We're getting there. I asked the brother, I said, how long do I have to preach? They say, as long as I can go. So... That is why I asked Pastor Tana, I believe, I asked him, I, I, can I preach for two days? Because the apostles love to preach what we call the everlasting gospel. You know that gospel? Paul preached that gospel in the book of Acts of the Apostle one day. And somebody fell off the window and broke his neck and died. And Paul went down, resurrected the person back to life, and continued preaching until dawn. I said, wow, those guys must have an, have an African anointing. <laughs> but we will get somewhere. Amen. So two things that is very important here in order for us to maximize our potential I want you to get this. There are many points of many principles I'm going to give, but two things are important. One, you must know the source of your potential. The source of your potential. And number two, you must know the purpose of your potential. Come on, are you with me? So, a source, when we talk about a source, a source is the place that forms the starting point from which something originates. A source is the place that forms the starting point from which something originates. In other words, your, the greatest or your greatest development of potential and the fulfillment of your destiny will come when you are aware of your infinite nature, that is, your divine source. Can I say that again? The development of your potential and the fulfillment of your destiny will come when you discover your divine source. It says, for in him, that is in Christ, we live. And move and have our being. Come on, are you with me? For in what? In Christ, we do what? We live, we move, and we have our being. I want you to take note of this. It says, in him. Not in ourselves, but what? In him you live. In him. You move, and in him we have what our being. That means, or this denotes our union with Christ. As believers, and of course leaders in the body of Christ, we must understand that we are nothing without Christ. We must recognize this fundamental truth that God is the source of all things. Come on, do you understand that now? So in other words, the source of your potential is God. 
So if God is the source of your potential, in other words, the purpose of your potential can only be defined by God and not defined by you. Are you with me? In other words, the limitation of your potential is only set by God and not by any man or any spirit or any principality. So in other words, your circumstances cannot determine the limit of your potential. Because only your source. Oh, come on. Let, let, let me put it this way. Uh, I always love to explain it this way. How many of you have a vehicle? You have a car. You have a car. Or a motorbike, whichever. Something that is propelled by fuel or gas or whatever it is. Right? You have a car? What car do you have? Are you trying to think of your car? You've forgotten it. You have a car. Your speedometer. How, long, how many does it read? 220, 240, 260? How many? 220. Yours is 220. That's good. Some of you, yours is 240. 240 or 28, right? Have you ever, hello brother, have you ever accelerated your car to 220 before? If I ask you why, some of you think that if you accelerate that car to the limit, 220, you think that your car is going to fly in the air. It's just something is just going to it's just going to tear in pieces. But do you know the manufacturer of that car have actually tested that car and proven that that car can accelerate to 220 and still run on that road perfectly. Nothing is going to happen. Do you know that? Come on, come with me. I want to come with me. Now, as far as Australia is concerned, I don't know other place. I think the highest you are allowed to go is 110, right, by law. That is what I see on your express. So, in other words, now I want you to understand, the car, the manufacturer of your car says, this car can go for 240 or 220. But there is a law that places a limitation on that car that says you should not or you cannot go beyond 110. So as a result of that, every time you sit on that car, there is something that tells you you cannot go beyond 110. You must stick, I mean, you, you must stick to that number. You can't go beyond that. I learned there is a highway in Germany. When you go there, it's a highway, an express lane in Germany where you are allowed to run as fast as you can. And I was told that if you, there is a certain number, if you come below that number, if the cops come, they actually give you a ticket for slowing down on, the, on that expressway because you were supposed to run. People are thinking, I think I need to go to Germany so I can race on that place. Come on, is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So in other words, there is a law that is placing a limitation on that car. But yet that car can function beyond that number. That is exactly what is happening to us. That the potential that God has given to us can and should be maximized. But somehow our mind has placed a limitation on the gift of God in our life that we are not functioning to our full capacity. That is why I say you can double your impact. Come on, is somebody hear what I'm saying? Okay, let's jump because of time. Let's come. Let's understand the purpose of your potential. Now, it says, God has created every man with a definite purpose in him. And to fulfill this purpose, he has given every one of us potentials. As you express your talents and gifts, you keep growing into your true image of who you are in Christ Jesus. I want to say that. As you express your talents 
your gifts, you keep what growing into the true image of who you are in Christ what Jesus. One of the greatest tragedy in life is to live without discovering your true purpose in Christ and your divine assignment which fulfills that purpose. One of the greatest tragedy in life, I say it again, it is for you to live life without discovering your true purpose in Christ and your divine assignment which fulfills that purpose. Your gifts and your talents are purposely created and given by God, not just for yourself. Are you with me? But it is given to you by God for the benefit of others. I want to say that again. Your potential, your gift, your talent, your ability is given to you not for you, but for the benefit of others. I love the way Paul puts it in Ephesians chapter number 3, verse number 2. If you want to write that scripture verse, write. Paul said, surely, from the new internet, NIV, new international version, Paul said, surely, you have heard about the administration of God's grace, which is his gift, which was given to me for you. I don't know whether you understood what Paul just said. He said, you know the grace of God, the gift of God that is given to me by God for you. So in other words, the gift in me is not for me, but it is for you. I'm going to come to that because we're going to get to that point for you to realize that when you don't discover your gifts which God has given to you and maximize your gift for the benefit of others, you are considered a wicked man or woman. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I'm going, to show, I'm, going to, I'm going to bring that to you so that you understand. We're, go, we're going to get there. It's going to get interesting. Because that, that would drive some of you back to God to discover what is your gift so that you can make use of it. Because it will make you to realize that whatever capacity you are serving in this house, or in what you do for the Lord, you must have that mindset that it is not for you, but it is the benefit for the benefit of others. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So that you will never pick offense in what you do for others, because you must understand you are called by God to serve others with that gift that God has given to you. Come on, is somebody here what I'm saying? Now let's go on. Come with me, let's look at this one. The parable of the talent. It's going to get interesting here. Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew chapter number 25. I want you to come with me because we're going to spend some time with this parable here because I want to take it verse by verse to expound some things to you from it so that we can get some principles out of it. Because many of us have read the parable of the talent but it is an interesting illustration of not just moral lessons but we can also learn some spiritual lessons that will help us to maximize our God-given gifts in our service to Him. And when you begin to understand these spiritual lessons and these moral lessons that you can learn from the parable of the talents, it will cause you to step out by faith 
for the kingdom of God. And when you do this, it does not only pleases the Father, but it brings an eternal reward to you. Are you with me? So Matthew chapter number 25, beginning from verse number 14 down, I'm going to read to verse number, to the end, to verse number 30. Are you there? It says, for the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents. Remember, your talent is your potential. Do you understand that? To another, two, and to another one. But to each one according to to his own ability. I want to take note of that. Every one was given a gift according to their ability. Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents, which means he has ten. And likewise, he who had received two talents gained two more also. But he who had received one talent went and dug in the ground and hid his lot's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good. A faithful servant. You were faithful over few things. Now I will make you ruler over what? Many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. He also who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you gave to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done. Good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. Now I will make you ruler over many things. He said, enter into the joy of your Lord. <laughs> but he who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I know you to be a hard man. You do not reap where you do not sow, neither do you gather where you have not scattered seeds. And I was afraid. And went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I do not reap where I sow and do not gather where I scattered my seed. So, you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers that at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Take note of that. Therefore, take the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten. For to everyone who has more will be what? Will be given. In other words, translation. To those who maximizes their talents, more is given to them. But to the one who does not have, in other words, who does not maximize his talent, even that which he has shall be taken from him and given to another. And that man, the scripture says, shall be cast as an unprofitable servant into outer darkness where there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Come on, are you with me? Now, there are six principles we can learn from this. Are you ready to go with me on this one? From this parable. Number one, let's come verse by verse. Let's come to verse number 15. 
Matthew chapter 25, verse 15. Let's get principle number one. He said, to one he gave talents, to another, to one he gave five talents, to another he gave two, to another he gave one, to each one according to his own ability. So number one thing you must understand here, there is no one person seated here today that can say, God did not give me a gift or a talent. I want to say that again. There is no one person seated here today that can say, God did not give me a gift. Because from this parable, it is clear that to all its servants, the master gave talents. Are you with me? But we must understand, each one was given a talent according to their ability. So, it is not the amount of talent that is given to you, but it is more of your ability. So, in other words, you are graced by God by virtue of your ability. So, God has given to you that which he knows that you are able to handle. Now the scripture says the master di distributes his goods or his talent according to the ability of each person. This shows that God has given to every man in proportion to what he can handle. In other words, God will not give you a task. God will not give you a vision. God will not give you an assignment that you cannot handle. God will not entrust you with something that you cannot fulfill. In other words, your God-given ability is adequate to his responsibility. I want to say that again. Your God-given ability is adequate to his responsibility. In other words, the grace of God in you matches the assignment he has given to you. The only time there will be a hindrance to the development of the maximizing of your potential, it is when you begin to develop what I call a subordinate mindset of your ability and begin to create a sense of inadequacy or a tendency where you begin to underestimate yourself and your ability. That is the only time you can limit the potential of God in you. Are you with me? Do you understand that? In other words, the only time you bring a limitation on your car is when the law of the land says you cannot go beyond 110. So when you step and you are running 120, something flips in you. I can't go beyond 110 because the cops are going to give me a ticket. I'm going to lose my point. So what you do, you remove your leg, right? You slow down and come to that limit. So the only time you limit the functioning of that car is when you think about the law of the land. Come on, are you with me? So likewise, the only time you limit your gift or your potential is when you yourself with your mindset begin to underestimate your gift and begin to say, I cannot do it. Come on, is somebody hear what I'm saying? Now, 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 let me break it down. Let me break it down because one of the things I want you to understand here is that I don't want you to see it more that like we're only talking about spiritual gifts. This is applicable to every aspect of your life. I want you to broaden this. This has to do with your career. It has to do with your business. It has to do with your finance. It has to do with your marriage. Listen to me. How many times... You have set a goal 
or a vision, but yet you have not done anything concerning that vision or that dream. Are you hearing what I'm saying? You wake up one morning and something tells you this, 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 you have this ability, you can do the, do the but something, ah, oh, nah, I'm not ready to go that way. Come on, are you with me? Do you understand that? I want you to understand this. If, if I may put it this way, it takes, some, it takes somebody who is mature to understand this. God will not stop you. The devil cannot stop you. But the only being or the only thing that can stop you is you. Do you understand what I just said? Because God has already assigned you. So go fulfill it. The devil cannot stop you. But the only person that can stop you is you. Because if you are going to maximize your potential and deal with some of the hindrances, some of you need to wake up in the morning, sleep very well, have a nice dinner, go to bed, sleep very well, wake up in the morning and go to your bathroom. You see that big mirror you see in front of you. Right in your bathroom. I want you to point your hand right in front of that mirror. If you can deal with that thing you see on that mirror, everything will be well. Some of you didn't catch that. Because the problem is you. Come on, are you with me? But let me say this. The keynote here, I want you to understand from this principle is that everyone has been endowed with a gift. You have a God-given gift in you. Come on, are you with me? Principle number two. Let's come to this. Come, verse number 16 and verse number 17. I want us to read that. It said, Then he who had received five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two talents gained two more also. Now, I want you to understand this. It is very clear from this parable that the master sought for profit from the servant's stewardship over his goods. Are you with me? The master, when he was giving the gift, the talent to his servant, he gave them those gifts with an expectation in him that when he comes back, he's not going to receive that talent the way he gave to them. He wants it back with interest. Do you understand? He wants it back with what? With profit. In other words, God is profit-oriented. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Now, listen carefully to me. This same parable of the talent is also recorded in the book of Luke chapter number 19. But when you read it from the, from the Luke chapter number 19, the, the writer of the book of, of Luke stressed it a little bit and said, the master said to them before he left, when he gave them gift, he said, do business till I come. One translation that he said to them when he gave them, he said, Occupy till I come. One translation that he said to them, Go and make investment with the gift that I have given to you. He said, And see to it that you make profit for me before I come. Come on, is somebody hear what I'm saying? So therefore, the understanding here is this. Every gift God has given to you, God has given you with an expectation that you will bring forth fruit or you will multiply that which has been given to you. Are you with me? So, two of the servants understood the expectation of their master 
that profit will be required from that which had been entrusted into their responsibility. Clearly, the stewardship of God demand that you engage in business and make investment of your gifts, your talent, your skills, or what you call your potential. In other words, you must trade and earn until he comes. Come on, are you with me? A lot of us are so idle. We are not working. We are not laboring our gift. Every believer must be profit-oriented in the pursuit of their destiny and divine purpose. Why? Because your profit is an indication of your faithfulness. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because when the one who traded, who got five, came and said, I have five, the master said to him, well done, thou good and what? Faithful what? Servant. But the one who got one and did not do anything, the master did not call him faithful. He called him wicked. So in other words, your profit is an indication of your faithfulness. So in other words, if you are not reproducing, it means that you are not faithful with that which God has entrusted to you. Come on, yeah, is somebody catching what I'm saying? If you are a leader in this ministry, I want to say it boldly, and you are not reproducing yourself or you are not being fruitful in your assignment, it means that you are not faithful to God. I didn't say you are not faithful to the ministry or to the man of God. I say you are not faithful to God. Now, this is not limited just to the leaders. It is applicable to every one of you here, hearing the sound of my voice. If you are saved, you've received Jesus as your Lord and personal Savior, but all you do is to come into this place week after week and to just warm up the seat and do nothing with your gift and talent, you are not faithful to God. Come on, are you hearing what I'm saying? Principle number three. Let's go on. Principle number three. Come to verse number 18. Verse number 18 says, He who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his lot's money. The easiest way to despise your gift and kill your dream is to hide your gift and do nothing. Are you with me? That is why I said there are many of us seated here today. God has given you dreams. You've had vision concerning what you need to do for your marriage to succeed. You have things, ideas that God has given to you for business. You have a lot of strategies God has given to you. But the truth of the matter is that most of you have done nothing. So often, many have done nothing with their gift, with their vision, and with their dream. Because of this, they have not reached their full potential. There is a man called Charles. He said, there is no heavier burden than an unfulfilled potential. Do you know why? Do you realize? I don't know about you, but this is me. My call and my assignment 
is an apostolic grace that demands that I proclaim the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ in the nations of the world or anywhere I have the opportunity. Now, I realize this, that any time I have this opportunity of ministering the word, I don't care how you feel, whether you are happy or not. By the time I leave this place, I'm going to lift up my hands and mm -mm, I preach very well, Lord. Thank you. Because there's that excitement that comes in me that I have fulfilled my assignment. Are you catching what I'm saying? So, I don't care how much is given to me. Whether I'm being given an offering or I'm not given an offering. But I go to God, Lord, your will I have done. Come on, are you with me? But when I sit down and I am not doing anything, there is this frustration that comes within me and I feel that something is wrong. I feel like I'm sick. You know, it's like I'm restless. I don't know about you. Have you ever felt that? Oh, let me help you out. Let me help you out. When you are walking, if I may use that word, you are walking in an assignment that God has not assigned you, no matter how successful you are, you don't have peace. Do you notice that? I don't know whether some of you have noticed that. Take for example, you are called to be a doctor. That is your passion. You study for it. But you've graduated but you are not practicing. You are doing something else. You know how frustrating it is that you are going to the office in the morning, but you don't find that joy going to that job. Even though you have money from it, but yet you are not happy. There is no heavier burden than an unfulfilled potential. So therefore, understand this. Success is a product of your work. I want to say that again. Success is a what? It's a product of what? Your work. You must work out your potential to increase and become profitable. In other words, life is full of possibility if only you will work out your potential. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 14, verse 23, that in all labor, there is profit. In all labor, there is what? Come on, I don't know whether you can connect this. The master wants profit out of your gift. But the scriptures say, how do you get profit? It says profit comes out of your labor. So in other words, your gift must be put to work in order for there to be profit. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Some of us are praying for certain kind of miracles. Miracles of God's divine favor or whatever it is. Listen to me. The blessings of God does not come to an idle hand. It doesn't matter if I take the whole gallon of anointing oil in this house tonight, pour it upon you, rub it from your head to your toe, slap you, clear you, slay you, lift you up, prophesy to you, and tell you you are going to be a millionaire tomorrow. You will remain poor as you are, except you go and put to work. That's what God has given to you. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I want to say this. Listen, listen, listen. I want to get this. The continent of Africa is said to be the richest continent upon the face of the earth. Do you know that? Listen to me. And the most religious continent you can ever think of is the continent of Africa. I mean, they pray. But yet, the most poorest continent upon the face of the continents of the world is still the same continent of Africa. And somebody look at me. It's so rich, 
But yet the people are living in, in the line of poverty. They love the line of poverty. You ask me why. They pray a lot. But you know what? They don't use their head to do anything. I give you an example. Let me give you an example so you understand this. When Moses encountered God at the burning bush, you know the story very well. When Moses saw the bush burning with fire, but it was not consumed, Moses came close and encountered God. And God said, I will send you to Egypt to deliver my people out of Egypt. Moses was not willing to go. It took a miracle to convince Moses to respond to that assignment. And God asked Moses, first of all, he said, what do you have in your hand? Moses said, it, it is just a stick. It's just a rod. And God said to him, now put that thing down on the floor. When they put it down on the floor, it became a sap. Moses was scared. And God said, no, don't, don't be scared. Hold it by the tail. And Moses held it by the tail and it became a rod. And the Lord said to him, with that rod in your hand, right? With that thing in your hand, that gift I put in your hand, Will I use to destroy the Egyptians and will I use to bring my people out of Egypt and lead them through? So what you need is in your hand. When you go through the scripture, every plague that Moses brought upon the nation of Egypt, he always stretched forth that rod and spoke. Until the final plague and Pharaoh said, let them go. Now when they came out of Egypt or coming out of Egypt, some people say 2 million people, some people say 3 million people, whatever the case may be. They came to the point where before them was a Red Sea. Behind them was the Egyptian. On the right side was the high mountain, and on the left side on the high mountain. And the, the scripture said the children of Israel realized that they have been brought into a trap. Are you catching what I'm saying? And all of them looked to Moses and said, Moses... Was it that there was no grave in Egypt that you should have left us to die there and for you to bring us to die this kind of death? They were so angry and disappointed because they knew death has come. Moses responded back to God. Read the scripture. Moses went into the mode of prayer. Do you know the response of God to Moses? For the Egyptians that you see today, you shall do what? You shall see them what? No more. The answer to the problem was in the hand of Moses. But Moses was doing the wrong thing. He was praying when he's supposed to act, to put to work that which is in his hand. That is what is happening to most of us. What you need for your success in life has been given to you. It is called your talent. It is called your gift. It's called your potential. But the problem is that most of us, we are doing nothing concerning our gift and our potential. As a result of that, we are not prospering. Most of us are spending time to fast and to pray. Some of your prayers and fasting is unnecessary. Don't misunderstand me. I didn't say prayer and fasting is not important. But some of you are fasting and praying when you are supposed to be walking. Do you understand that? In other words, there has to be a balance. Are you catching what I'm saying? In what you do for the maximizing of your gift. Come on, I, 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 are, we, are we progressing yet? Now, there's a brother called Steve. He said, to give anything less than your best is to sacrifice your gift. For you to give anything less than your best, it means that you have sacrificed the gift. The gift is a waste because every gift must be maximized. In other words, it must be used to the best of his ability to bring the best out of it. So anything less than the best is a, sac is a sacrifice of the gift. Come on, is somebody, is somebody catching what I'm saying? Oh. Some of you will leave this place, I pray in the name of Jesus. 
that your prayers will become strategic in praying with understanding and praying with revelation concerning what God has given to you so that you know how to ask. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So that you will not be asking, Lord, give me a house. But rather you'll be asking the Lord to reveal his gift to you so that you can maximize your gift. Because the maximizing of your gift will ultimately bring those houses and those things that you're looking for. Most of us are chasing the shadow rather than going after the substance. If you lay hold of the substance, you will lay hold of the shadow. Come on, are you with me? Is somebody catch what I'm saying here? Okay, let's move on. Let's move on. Principle number four. Let's come to verse number 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Listen carefully. The Lord of those servants came and did what? Settled accounts with them. One of the things you must understand is this. God will require accountability from you for every gift he has given to you. Do you understand that? God will do what? Require what? Accountability from you for every gift he has given to you. In other words, you must give an account. Now, you are accountable for your gift and not for my gift. Can I say that again? You are what? Accountable for your gift and not for another man. This means you must learn to become content with what you have been entrusted with because this is the measure God has found due to you and by this, he will hold you accountable. So, let me explain this. I want you to understand this. For example, this ministry here. I don't know how many you are. Take, for example, this ministry is 300 people here. Or we have 300 members here. Are you with me? But across the road, there is another church that probably have 1,000 members. But this ministry has been going for 10 years. And we have only 300 people. But the church next door has only been for less than two years, but they have 1,000 members. So something in me tells me, why can I be existing for 10 years? I only have 300. But that man is less than two, two years. He has, what, 1,000. Most times we have a tendency to think that we are doing something wrong. So therefore, let us leave what we are doing to go learn the strategy and the principle of the other man so that we will not implement what that man is doing here because our desire is to grow or to multiply to become that number. But one thing we don't realize is that every man has been given a gift according to the measure of his ability God gave to him. So God's grace to you at this particular time could be 300 and not 1,000. So you must learn to become content with where you are in the administration and in the maximizing of your gift rather than becoming concerned with another man's gift which God has not entrusted to you. It becomes a distraction from your assignment. So a lot of us are filled with this mindset where we begin to compete with one another and as a result, most of us have left our gift and our assignment. We are functioning in another man's gift and another man's assignment. And you wonder why you are not successful in life. Come on, are you with me? You will answer to God for how you used 
and stewarded your gifts, your talent, and calling that God has given to you and how you fulfill your purpose. This you must understand, people of God. It is a joy and a rewarding experience to use your unique gifts and ability to make a positive impact in the world for the kingdom of God. Come on, there is what? A reward. Okay, principle number five. Come with me. Matthew chapter, num- uh, see on Matthew chapter 25, verse 20 and Verse 20 and 21. Now, the servant said, I have gained five more talents besides them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over what? Many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. So, it is very, uh, I think Charles Spongeon said, said this. He said, it is a great folly to despise the day of small things. For it is usually God's way to begin his great works with small things. Do you understand that? He said, it is foolishness for you to despise the little things. He said, because in the plan of God, The great thing that he does always begin with the small. Most of us are always having this expectation of the big things without realizing that the big thing begins from the small things. Two things opens the door for you into the greater things. If you cannot or if you are not faithful in your service, you can never be faithful in your leadership. I don't know whether you understood what I said. If you are not faithful in serving, you can never be faithful in leading. And you know, one of the problems is that most of us think that we have the anointing. Eh? Let me speak to you. It doesn't happen in this part of the world. It happens where I come from. Where the set man over the church or over the ministry is doing his job. And the others are doing their job. But for some reason, the others think that the growth of the church is because of their gift. Not necessarily because of the set man's gift. Because they think that the anointing is there. So, they don't want to serve and wait for the time of their release. They always want to step out to start their own because they think that they have the anointed. And something you don't understand, the principle of spiritual covering when you function under the grace of a man, and sometimes you think it is your ability and never understand that it is a grace that covers you. Are you with me? Let me help you. It is like the story, I don't know whether you know, about the donkey that Jesus rode on. And when the donkey, Jesus was riding on the donkey, the donkey realized that men were plucking leaves and throwing in front of him and throwing their cloth and said, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And that donkey went and met another donkey. He said, do you know what happened today? He said, behold, I was praised as a king as as I was coming. People were throwing leaves and everything on me. And I was coming like a king. And the other donkey said, oh, thou fool. They were not throwing the leaves and the cloth because of you. They were throwing it on the ground. He said, because of the person you were carrying on the back. Are you catching what I'm saying? That sometimes some of us think that the outworking of the grace of God in the meeting is because of us. But don't understand, it's sometimes not because of you. It is because of a certain dimension of grace that you are functioning under. But the main part of it I want you to understand here is this. There is an eternal reward for everyone who maximizes their God-given gift. That is what you need to get. There is what? A reward. Not just from men. 
There is a reward that comes from God when you make use of your gift to the capacity of to the best you can that God has assigned for you. Therefore, it is very important that you maximize the use of your talent. Not just for your own selfish motive, but of course for the honor of God. I give you the scripture, Colossians chapter number 3. Verse 23 and 24. Colossians chapter number 3. Verse 23 and verse 24. It says, whatever you do, walk heartily as, as for the Lord and not for men. Knowing that from the Lord, you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Other translations say, whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord and not unto men. It says, for the Lord himself will reward you because you are not working for men, you are working for God. That should encourage you, whatever you are doing. You may, you may be doing something that is not recognized by any man, but I want you to understand that you must put in you that what you are doing is not for any man, but it's simply for God. And if that is your attitude, and if that is your motive and pursuit, listen to me, you will always get a reward. Why? Because you will do things with your whole heart rather than complaining, murmuring, and all kinds of excuses. Why? Because you are not doing it for any man. If you remain loyal... And steadfast with a few things. Remember, he said, God will make you ruler over many things in his time. So take note of that. He said to the servant, because you have been faithful over a few things, now your reward is that I will make you ruler over what? Many things. That, that is the whole message of itself. Your next level in God is determined by your faithfulness to your present level. Did you hear what I said? I want to say it again. Your next level, the breakthrough to your next level is connected to your faithfulness in the present level where you are. God will not give you another prophetic word or another prophetic direction until you become obedient and faithful to the last prophetic word and the last prophetic direction. A lot of people are coming to meetings. You love to go to what they call prophetic meetings. You want another prophetic word, another prophecy. What is God saying? What is God saying? You know what God is saying? God is saying you need to be faithful with the last assignment that I gave to you or with the last prophetic word that I gave to you. Stop chasing prophecy. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And start walking in obedience to the last assignment of the prophetic word that he gave to you. Come on. Principle number six. Am I getting somewhere? I'm just starting, okay? Let me take some water now. Principle number six. Let's see verse number 24 to verse number 27. Then, this is interesting. He who had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. You do not reap where you do not sow. Neither do you gather where you have not scattered seed. Therefore, I was afraid. And I hid your talent. He said, see, take that which you have given to me. And his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant. You knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. 
that at my coming, I would have at least received it back with what? Interest. Now, I want you to get something here from this principle. The servant who got one talent made an excuse trying to justify his laziness for not engaging his talent to make profit. He said he was afraid and he did nothing with his talent. Three things you must take here that will become a hindrance to you in the fulfillment or in the maximizing of your talent or your potential. Number one, excuses. If you're writing that, right, excuses. Number two, laziness. Number three, fear. Come on, are you with me? So, the servant said, the reason why I did not make use of my talent or did not make profit is because, are you catch what I'm saying? Um, you know, you know, you have, you all, listen. In other words, I want to hear me clearly. There is no one seated here today that is excusable. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Thank you. You really want me to preach a lot. Hallelujah. There is no one here that is what in a, that is excusable. In other words, you don't have any excuse, or rather, in the sight of God, there is no excuse that you will give that is justifiable why you did not use your talent. That Lord, there was no time. Oh Lord, you know my husband. Oh, it was because of my wife. Oh Lord, uh, you know I was so busy. Oh, I was so tired. Oh, this and that can never be an excuse. Sometimes when you ask people, why do they not do what you have assigned them to do? The excuse you, they give sometimes is never justifiable in the sight of God. Now, not only that spiritually, there are many of us who have not been able to accomplish our dreams and our vision because we have one excuse after the other that we give why we have not been able to do what we need to do. Some of you see that here, the Lord has laid in your heart to start a business. You've conceived that idea. You have everything laid out to some of you, but yet you have never done anything. You keep giving one excuse after the other. Something is say, okay, don't worry, I will do it this year. But before you know this year comes to an you say, I will do it next year. So there have been a carryover from one year to another. One project from last year, you brought it this year. As a matter of fact, some of you, your resolution for 2018 was your resolution for 2017. And this is already the fourth month. Before you know it, there will be a carryover of your resolution for 2018 to become the one of 2019. You are giving excuses upon excuses and you have not been able to achieve your dreams. So, in other words, your talent or your potential has become dormant on top strength. Cap capability, hidden talent that have not yet been maximized, discovered, developed, and maximized to bring profit. So in other words, you have unused sources within you. You are asking God to bless you when he has already blessed you. Come on, are you with me? Laziness. Write this scripture for us. The Bible says, a lazy man will say there is a lion on the road. Therefore, it's not going to go out. Did you hear what I said? A lazy man will always give an excuse and say, there is a lion on the road, so therefore it's not going to go out. Read. It's in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter number 22, verse 13. Right. Proverbs chapter number 22, verse 13. And also Proverbs chapter number 20, verse number 4. And the third thing, the third thing that will be a hindrance to you is fear. Listen to me. I said if fear, fear is the thief of possibility. 
I want to say it again. Fear is what? Is the thief of what? Possibility. In other words, fear will always rob you of every divine opportunity that God has given to you. Fear. Whenever fear comes, it brings doubt. And when there is doubt, it stops you from doing what God has assigned you to do. How many times you have been afraid to start a thing because you are afraid that you are going to fail? How many times you have not made an investment because you are afraid that the system is going to fail and you are going to lose everything? While many are making investment, many are starting, they are succeeding, succeeding, but yet you are afraid. Fear will stop you. The guy said, I was afraid. And as a result of that, I hid my talent. So in other words, fear stopped him from making profit. Let me, get, let me, let me, let me, let me tell you this. I got saved at a very young age. I got saved at the age of 14, going to 15, even though I was born into a Christian family. At the age of 14, going to 15, I gave my life to the Lord. Interestingly, at the age of 18 years was when I started pastoring my first church. I was 18 years old when I first started pastoring my first church. And a few years after that, 1st of February, 1996, after pastoral work for a period of time, was when I started traveling to the nations. 1st of February, 1996. That is how many years now? That is 22 years. For 22 years, not 22 years of ministry, 22 years of travel. And today, I have been to 51 nations of the world. And some of those nations, I have been there more than 40 times, some nations. For Australia, for example, I've been coming to Australia since 2005. And I've been coming to this nation at least two to three times every year since 2005. Now listen to me. People have asked me this question. How were you able to connect into these nations? How did you do it? It will interest you to notice that the first time I left my nation, going to a country, I was not invited by any man. Are you with me? I never knew anybody. I never had any connection. I just felt God has called me to the nation. All I did was pack my bag, got my ticket, and when the first nation I went to was the nation of Ghana. I got there with a one-way ticket without a return ticket. Arrived in the nation, got there by 7 p.m. in the evening, and now I looked up after our job, looked up and down. I have nowhere to go. The money I had in my pocket cannot even pay a hotel bill for more than three days. But Lord, I am here. It's a long story if I tell you how God supernaturally opened the connections and the doors. That gave me boldness to begin to go into nations. Some of the nations I went to, I never knew anybody. I just stepped in and God just opened the door. Why? Because I just discovered. But if I was afraid, I will not be where I am today. Listen to me. The maximizing of your potential demands faith that you must take a step of faith or take action of risk for you to be able to step out to be able to become what God wants you to be. Come on, is somebody hearing what I'm saying? There must be a what? An action of faith. So, interestingly, when this man gave this excuse of his excuse, his fear, but the master responded and called the unprofitable servant. He called him a wicked servant. A what? A wicked servant. Why did he call him a wicked servant? It was because 
he withheld his gift from being used. Come on, are you with me? To withhold your gift from being used for the benefit of others and the advancement of the kingdom of God is considered wicked. Because whatever God has given to you, if what God has given to me is for you, but for, for one reason, I hold back what God has given in order for you not to, mag, to benefit from it. That means I am considered a wicked man. Imagine how this spiritual family here would become if each and every one of us here maximizes our gift. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because your strength may be my weakness. Huh? My strength may be your weakness. The releasing of my gift strengthens you in your weakness. The releasing of your gift strengthens me in my weakness. And when I don't release it, it means that you don't benefit from it. So in other words, some of the weakness in the house is as a result of some of you not manifesting the gift of God within you. For example, I see you always give opportunity for testimonies. Do you realize that your testimony actually builds the faith of somebody to believe that they also can do what you have done or God can do for them what he has done for you? But some of you are timid, you are afraid, you are shy, you don't want people to know about your business. As a result of that, you don't share your faith. Do you know how many people would have got saved if only you opened your mind and spoke to them? How many times God has stared in your heart to share Christ with somebody, but you were afraid and you didn't say anything? And they have gone and they have not. How many, it could be even a loved one in your family that God has said, go speak or minister to them, but you did not minister to them, but you realize a few days after that they have passed on. Come on, it's, 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 it, I don't know whether somebody's catching what I'm saying. Oh, it was a blessing when, I, when we walked in here. As a young boy, I, I saw them at the gate. I was shaking. What is your name? You know, with the t-shirt. He gave, I don't know his name. I forgot his name. I should, what, you, what is your name? You, what is your name? He told me his name. And he tapped, he tapped, the boy tapped me. He said, do you know Jesus? Right here at the gate. A young boy, he said, do you know Jesus? I asked, I said, who is Jesus? I said, no. I said, who is Jesus? He looked at He said, it's up there. It's up there. Well, the sweet part of it is that he is bold enough to share. Imagine, I believe that young boy, or that small boy, must have told many people, even in his school, do you know Jesus? And probably his teacher said, who is Jesus? Or whatever. And it sticks to their heart. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But most of us are seated here like that. Our gift has not been maximized because of one reason or the other. Every gift given to you is an opportunity granted by God to improve the life of somebody else. I want to say this again. Every gift Giving to you is an opportunity granted by God for you to improve the life of somebody else. So therefore, maximizing your gift is an opportunity for you to become a solution to a problem. For this reason, you must take responsibility and become what? Profitable. Amen. I preach a lot. I'm not preaching again. I'm done. You know why? Because you guys have to go and buy the books and get the whole message. <laughs> Amen. Come on, church. Amen. Okay. The big question here, I'm going to conclude. The big question here that will be going in your mind for some of us is, how do I know my potential? How do I know my gift? How do I know my calling? 
so that I can maximize and fulfill it. I'm going to read this. Within every believer, within everyone here are latent potentials that need to be discovered, developed, and maximized. These potentials, listen carefully, are interwoven in God's eternal purpose in Christ, which he had predestined for you before the foundation of the world. So in other words, if my potential is connected to Christ's purpose that God has predestined before the foundation of the world, it means my discovering of Christ is the discovering of my potential. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because my potential is connected in him. So, the more I know him, the more I know Christ, the more I increase in my knowledge of him, the more I increase in my knowledge and understanding of my divine call and purpose. Are you catching what I'm saying? So the truth is this. As we discover God's eternal purpose, we will discover our potentials. That is why every time when you read the scripture, Paul hears about the salvation of the people. He always prayed these prayers for them. That I cease not to give thanks to God for you. But I pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation knowledge of him so that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened that you might what know him and the hope of even the purpose or your destiny in him. And then it speaks about your reward that comes as a result of this knowing. Come on, is somebody catching what I'm saying? So your true purpose and potential is only in Christ. This means your purpose and potential can only be revealed, maximized, and fulfilled through your relationship with Christ. That is why your relationship with Christ is very important. To the extent that you know Christ, to that same degree, you will discover and walk in the fulfillment of your potential and your purpose. So your relationship with Christ is so vital for the fulfillment of your purpose because outside him, at the source and the one who defines your purpose, you can never find fulfillment. Neither can you maximize your purpose. It is simply in Christ. Are you with me? That is why, that is the greatest experience you can ever have in life. The knowing of Christ. Because that is where your fulfillment and your destiny is. Are you with me? Okay. I'm done. Let's stand on our feet. Come, let's stand on our feet. Hallelujah. There are more things I would have shared with you which you will find in the book. I called the next one, what I call essentials for maximizing your potential. Some of the things that are very important that will help you in maximizing your potential. One, I said, you must know your specific calling and your assignment. You must do what? Know your specific calling and what? Assignment. 
Paul and Peter both are called apostles of the Lord. Are you with me? But both of them do not have the same assignment. Peter, his assignment was to the Jew. Paul, his assignment was to the Gentile. And Paul said, Paul said, when you read the book of Galatians, the same grace that is working effectively in me is the same grace that is working effectively in Peter. But him told the Jew, but me to the Gentile. So in other words, you must know your specific calling and assignment in order for you to maximize your potential. Another thing I wrote here is this. You must identify your geographical location and your people group. Example. Prophet Jeremiah and Prophet Ezekiel in the scripture, both of them are prophets of the Lord. But God was specific with their geographical location or rather the metron of their ministry. God said to Ezekiel, I have called you, the Lord said, not as a prophet to the nations. I have not called you to a people of a foreign language that will not hear your speech. He said, I have only called you to your nation, the nation of Israel, to a people that will hear you and understand your message. God was specific in his call. But to Jeremiah, the Lord said to him, I have called you as a prophet to what? All nations. When you read the writings of Ezekiel and the writing of Jeremiah, they are so distinct in terms of the writing, in terms of what they said. If you are going to be successful, you must function in your divine assigned location. Are you hearing what I'm saying? That includes business. That includes everything you do in life. Come on, are you with me? Another essential that I said is that you must have a personal development plan. You must have what? A personal development what? Plan. Your plan must be very strategic because it must be in line with the vision and the eternal purpose of God for your life. And there are a few things I said. One, your vision must be clear. Two, you must develop an action plan. It is one thing to have a vision, but it is another thing to have a plan, but it's another thing to have a desire to pursue after the plan to bring the vision into reality. Some of us have vision, but we don't have a plan. Some of us have a vision, we have a plan, but there is no will to pursue after the plan to make the vision to become a reality. Come on, are you with me? Another thing I said, you must develop a growth mindset, a mindset to grow, a mindset to increase. If your mindset is 100, you will never grow beyond 100. So you must develop what? A growth what? Mindset. Another thing that is essential for the maximizing of your potential is that you must develop your spiritual capacity. Prayers is very essential for the maximizing of your gift. In other words, you must take your relationship to an intimate relationship with the Lord. You must establish and develop a constant and consistent prayer life with the Lord. Why? Because the source of your strength is God and your connection to him is your access to divine wisdom, revelation, skills, and ability to fulfill that with God as assigned for you. This one is very important. 
I said, in order for you to maximize your gift, you must study. You must do what? Study. Hear me clearly. Study your Bible. But beyond your Bible, study other books and materials that are relevant to your specific assignment. Are you hearing? Did you hear what I just said? I can give you scripture verses. Paul said to Timothy, when you are coming, bring what? My books for me. And he said to Timothy, till I come. I love the way the Amplified Translation puts it. He said, till I come, devote yourself to public and private reading. He said, do not neglect the gift that is in you. In other words, he's saying, if you do not study, the gift that you have in you that is given to you by the Spirit will be neglected. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Because some of the things you need, there are men who by experience have walked through that path and they have laid it down for you to be able to read study so that you know where they fail and where is their sense. So that when you pass through that way, you also will be guided through that process in order for you to maximize your gift. Are you with me? That is why when, I, when you sit with men of experience in their field or whatever it is, learn to keep quiet, to listen, rather than dominating the conversation you want to talk. I don't know whether somebody's here or what I'm saying. You sit with somebody, you're having a conversation, but you want to dominate the conversation. How do you learn when you keep talking, but you don't listen? Come on, is somebody here or what I'm saying? The other one, this one is very important. Mentoring. Or rather, in a spiritual time, you say, you must have a spiritual father. In other words, you must submit to the process of mentoring where there is a proper training so you can be developed. Why? Because there is no self-made man. Every man used by God in the scripture who fulfilled their divine purpose and destiny were men who submitted to the process of mentoring or spiritual fathering that shaped them into their destiny. Without Elijah, there will not be Elisha. Without Moses, there will not be Joshua. Without Paul, there will not be Timothy. Without Jesus, there would have not been the twelve. Without Barnabas, there would have not been Apostle Paul. They understood this process of mental. And one of the challenges that we have in this generation is that this generation is a fatherless generation. And we have failed to recognize men that God has given the experience to mentor us or to father us through the process of our journey. And as a result, many of us are making a shipwreck of our faith and not being able to maximize our gifts. That is why we must recognize the leaders, the set man of the house and the leaders that God has given to us to learn to submit to authority, to work with them in order for you to be what God wants you to be. Another thing again that is very essential for the maximizing of your gift, you must be focused. You must be what? Focused. A broken focus will always produce a broken dream. When you lose focus on where you are going to, you will be distracted. There is a parable we always give in Africa. We said, a man who is on a journey but keeps throwing stones to the dog, will never get to his destination or will get there late. In other words, when you are going on and the dog is back, you take it so you are strong. You see, you are distracted from where you are going. It's either the dog will come bite you and you'll be sent to the hospital and not get to your destination or by the time you get to your destination, you are already late because you keep chasing the dogs. Most of us have been distracted by many things that are not essential concerning your divine assignment. Some of us are distracted by association. Some of the friends you are connected to is a distraction to your divine destiny. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
Something some of us are engaged is a distraction. It has broken our focus. So focus is very important. The other one is that you must be diligent and consistent in your gift. The Bible says, Proverbs 22, 29, Seest thou a man who is diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings and shall not stand before mean men. Any man who is diligent and consistent will always accomplish his divine destiny. Another one I said here is team spirit. You must surround yourself with people who are positive spirit. And people who work as a team. People, listen, we are relational people. We are called to relate with anybody. But at the same time, we must be very careful with those that we relate to. Some folks are called, considered to be dream killers. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, that is very important. And the other one, the last one here is, finally, is rest. Somebody say rest. I love you guys here in Australia. You always take holidays. Not like we Africans, we walk and walk and walk. We don't understand what it means to rest. One of the ways you can refocus, renew your strength, renew your vision, and renew your strategy, you must learn to quit, take a break, and rest. There's a scripture I've given there. Jesus, after the disciples gather, Jesus came to his disciples and said, listen to me, you guys have walked a lot. Now, let us take a break. Come out to a private place and rest. Come on, is somebody hear what I'm saying? Because rest is very important for you, for the fulfilling or the maximizing of your gift. If not, you will die before your time. Are you catching what I'm saying? You will die before your time. Wives, wives who are here, tell your husband, you need to have a break. Is that your husband? Are you married? Where's your wife? I'm sure your wife will be excited hearing what I'm saying. It's going to tell you, you need to go for a holiday with her. You know someone? Fly somewhere, brother. <laughs> Amen. Rest. Very important. Amen. Now hold somebody in your left hand or your right hand. I believe I've given you a lot of information. Hold somebody. I just want you to pray for somebody. Just hold somebody, please. Amen. I know I've loaded you with a lot of information. I know I've loaded you with a lot of information. Some of those things might have flew over your head. But I trust the Spirit of God in the days ahead, the Lord will begin to bring them to your remembrance. That will stir you up. Because not only spiritually, I believe there are men and women seated here today. God has a great plan and future for your life. But it is connected to your next step of faith. To initiate that dream that God has placed for your life concerning that business, concerning your marriage, concerning your children, concerning the next step of that project. It is connected to it. But this work tonight, God is going to stir you up. It is time to take action and to see the manifestation of God's glory and of God's power over your life. Amen.